you claim that the, the notion of a, a Palestinian state is uh, inopportune at this time, perhaps in this generation, but hasn't it been a popular notion with almost half, some, uh, uh, maybe more than half of the Israeli electorate for a while? Well, first of all, uh, I'm not saying that it's only inopportune. I'm saying that it's totally impractical. And I'm saying this not as a religious fanatic or extremist. I'm saying this as a political scientist. You cannot achieve any stable political configuration if you divide the sovereignty between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. I defy anyone to do that unless you're prepared to work on wildly unrealistic and hence uh, uh, irresponsibly optimistic uh, assumptions. Unless you can discount uh, all the possible dangers and prepare to base your policy only on some wildly improbable best case scenario, you cannot divide the, the sovereignty between the river and the sea and reach a stable political configuration. But when you talk about, when you talk about the popularity of the idea, first of all, one of the greatest failings of the Israeli right wing is they haven't ever produced a alternative paradigm. Uh, the most withering criticism that the left wing have of the right wing in Israel, and I use left wing and right wing loosely because I prefer the term doves and hawks. I don't think it's a matter of left and right, but rather a matter of doves and hawks. But just to use the conventional uh, terminology, the most withering um, criticism that the left wing has of the right wing is what's your alternative? And the right wing has been very inarticulate in producing any, uh, any feasible and coherent uh, alternative. Uh, in, in fact, worse, now that some of them are coming up, uh, some of the alternatives offered by the right wing are even more improbable and more impractical and more dangerous than the two-state solution. But if, if you look at, what, at, at, the, at the opinion of the Israeli public, it's true that you will find that if they say, are you prepared to accept a two-state solution if this will bring lasting peace and stability? Well, yes, if it brings lasting peace and stability, maybe they would. On the other hand, the next question is, do you believe that a two-state solution will bring about a solution? They say no. A vast majority say no. So, so basically, it's a bit of a hoax to, to, pres to present the majority position of Israelis as supporting a two-state solution, because they would in a parallel universe where it would bring about uh, stability and peace, they, they might support it. But in this universe, they don't. Do you feel the... Uh Palestinians have sufficient international political support and political pressure that it may be uh, a, a train with so much inertia that it'd be difficult to stop. Well, the short answer is they have a lot of inertia. The question is why? <laughs> it's because there's been no pushback from Israel. If Israel spends minuscule, pathetic, ridiculous amounts on its, on its public diplomacy, you shouldn't be surprised that it's not garnering much support. Uh, you know, Israel today spends literally less than what a medium to large size company would be spending on promoting fast foods and snacks. And as I said before, if you're not investing in conveying your message, there's no reason to expect it to be conveyed. Uh, if Israel were to spend half a percent of GDP on public diplomacy, that would be a billion dollars. You can change a lot of minds with a billion dollars compared to the, the paltry amount of somewhere between 10 and 30 million dollars that they're spending today. Domestically? You mean changing minds, uh, Israelis' minds? And, and, and abroad. Uh, and, and, and abroad. Uh, can you imagine what the impact would be if Israel took a hundred million dollars for a, a, a PR assault across U.S. campuses, just focusing on the Hillel branches? It would make a tremendous impact. It would make a tremendous impact. What's $100 million for Israel? It's nothing. But Israel today has a, has a, has a, has a public, has a, has a gross uh, uh, domestic product of, of a quarter of a trillion dollars. Quarter of a trillion dollars. They're spending hundreds of millions, if not billions of shekels, on the Iron Dome, whose whole function 
is to intercept an explosive charge of 10 kilograms, which has no strategic value. They're spending a pittance on something which has enormous strategic value, like public diplomacy. It's completely illogical. Is it too late at this stage, you think, to, to stop this uh, juggernaut of uh, Palestinian nationalism? Well, you know, I can't say for sure. I, I believe it's not. The question is, you know, how, much, how robustly and how assertively they, 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 they go about it. And, you know, when they say it's a Palestinian juggernaut, it's just because Israel is letting it be a juggernaut. The Palestinian issue is not an issue in the Arab world anymore. The whole Arab world is imploding. No one really cares about the Palestinians except, you know, Israelis, J Street, uh, and, and, and they're the people who are creating the hype. How about Obama? You think it's a priority for him? I, I think Obama's uh, uh, position, among other things, is fueled by, by uh, uh, the people who are making a living out of this two-state solution business. Uh, and, of course, for Obama, it has a certain amount of attraction because, um, quite apart from his ideological leanings, but uh, because the only place that America might make any uh, or have any foreign policy triumphs is if they manage to force Israel to accept a Palestinian state. They seem to have no chance of any, of any uh, gains or any uh, achievements elsewhere in the, in, in the world. American foreign policy has been uh, on the retreat uh, uh, across the, the entire global front. Uh, they've allowed Russia suddenly to become a, a player of global stature. Uh, they've lost all influence in Egypt uh, and probably in other countries as well, including traditional allies like Saudi Arabia, because they've seen the lack of, of uh, American resolve. And so American policy across the board is, is pretty much a, a disaster. The only place where they may be able to show some achievement is by pressuring Israel. You suppose with uh, Obama's record of uh facilitating Islamist revolutions from Libya to Egypt, now to Syria, do you suppose that, that, that he may have an agenda in uh, weakening Israel through uh, territorial concessions? Well, I'm, you know, I, I'm not uh, a psychologist, but certainly that's, his, his actions would be consistent with something like that. Um, you know, uh, uh, I have friends in Russia who for years have been saying the United States basically uh, is allied with the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, they have, I don't necessarily agree with them, but they have uh, certain plausibility to their claims if you see what happened in Egypt, uh, if you see what's happened internally in the United States. Uh, th there does seem to be a certain amount of affinity between this administration and, and, the, and the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, I don't know whether this flows from naivety or from malice, but uh, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, the result will be the same. I, I could accept the argument that is being cornered. If Israel was spending large amounts of, of, uh, of resources on avoiding being cornered, but Israel's public diplomacy budget is laughable. The Israel's public diplomacy budget is laughable. And so if, if, you, if, you, if you're not investing in conveying your message, why would you be surprised if it's not being conveyed? You know, that's, that, that, that in my opinion is the biggest failure of, of, of Netanyahu. It's not that he's given in at any particular, uh, in any particular instant, uh, instance to pressure that was, that was uh, uh, exerted on him. It's that he hasn't built, um, put in place, place mechanisms to resist that pressure. In, in the United States, there are huge sources of support for Israel in Congress, in the general public, where, where Israel enjoys a four to one advantage over the, Palestine, over the Palestinians amongst evangelical Christians. But that's never been leveraged into, into a political clout that would make pressure for perilous concessions on the part of Israel politically toxic for any administration. I mean, can you, can you imagine, can you imagine uh, an a, a administration pressuring some country to institute gender apartheid? They couldn't do it, right?
They couldn't do it. And, and, and this, so exactly in the same way, no administration should be able to pressure the Israeli government to make concessions that would put 80% of its population and 80% of its economic uh, activity within the range of weapons being used today from territory evacuated and handed over to the Palestinians to, to administer. But isn't this a popular notion, the, the idea of uh, uh, carving West Bank uh, out, isn't it a popular notion among a, a large part of the Israeli electorate? Yes, because it's fueled by ignorance. What's happened is that the right wing has vacated the battlefield of ideas and allowed the, the, the left wing to promote the urban legend that Israel can maintain its security if it relinquishes the, uh, the highlands that overlook the coastal plain, i.e. The, the, the West Bank. Uh, from that territory, uh, you control virtually all the airfields, including the only international airport, uh, Ben Gurion. You control all major seaports, uh, apart from Elat, of course. Uh, you control the entire uh, uh, land uh, transport system, including major roads and, uh, and uh, rail. You uh, control most of the country's infrastructure installations and systems. And of course, 80% of the civilian population and 80% of economic activity. This could be shut down at will by anyone who's holding the high, the high ground of the, the West Bank. The West Bank Terrorist. is not, uh, t terrorists or even, even an adversarial regime. I mean, you know, is, is the Hamas a terrorist organization or is it an organized regime? It, it doesn't really matter what, what you call it uh, because I, I think the, 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 ex the conventional wisdom is if the IDF were to withdraw from uh, the West Bank today or Judea and Samaria, uh, the working assumption must be that sooner or later and probably sooner, some radical Islamist group will take over as they did in Gaza. You know, this is no longer right-wing scaremongering. This is the empirical precedent. Um, Where do you teach now? At, at the moment I'm not teaching. At the moment I'm uh, engaged in the establishment of an independent uh, uh, strategic uh, institute of my own, which uh, uh, I think is, uh, can fill a very vital function in the intellectual landscape in, uh, in Israel. How have your ideas been received at Tel Aviv University and among the academic, what you might consider academic liberal or left? Well, they've been received with great animosity. Uh, and uh, in many ways I've found uh, my way being blocked and impeded by people using their administrative power rather than the, their willingness to engage me on an, on an intellectual level. Uh, I found that more and more that the institutions and my access to student bodies is being blocked. It's not being blocked because the things I've, I've said and predicted have proved wrong, quite the opposite. Uh, I think most my analyses and most my predictions have outperformed the, the establishment's predictions and analyses. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't think that the left-dominated academia in Israel is interested in a level playing field. I think they're only interested in pluralism on condition that there's none. Um, and uh, I think it's very sad. Uh, sad uh, situation. And, and by the way, I, I think this feeds into the diaspora as well. Uh, I, I think the, the divide uh, in U.S. Jewry in, in many ways is a function of the fact that the people who uh, are f feeding, the people who are giving the intellectual input um, to, say, uh, the liberal Jewry, are people who, who uh, have no uh, intellectual opponents. So there's no way of balancing that input that the, the uh, liberal Jews here are getting, people from, from the radical left, from Haaretz newspaper, uh, from people like uh, the 
um, left-leaning intellectuals, uh, without going into names, but 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 there's there's no counterbalance to that. Uh, they're not receiving an, an alternative view, you know. And, and I I found that uh, uh, very much so when I was teaching here at uh, at USC and the Hebrew Union College. You know, I was saying things that, that people would readily accept, but they hadn't heard before. Uh, for instance. Uh, there's a map formulated by the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff designating for President Johnson the areas of critical security importance for Israel, which includes the entire uh, West Bank, Judea and Samaria, uh, the Golan Heights and even portions of Sinai. Now, I must have asked at a hundred events, how many people know about this map? Okay? If one percent knew about it, it was a lot. So you know, this, this could be an important uh, piece of information that could uh, inform liberal juries that there is a, a critical security uh, component to the West Bank and it should not be given up. It should not be given up, not because of right-wing fanatical uh, religious zealots, because that's what uh, uh, level-headed and, and uh, cold logic dictate level-headedness and cold logic dictate. Um, so so I, I, f I feel that much of this, uh, much of this uh, uh, divide is a result of the lack of information. And in, in, in many ways, as I said before, the right wing has vacated the battlefield. There's been no concerted drive um, by the right wing in Israel to inform their public and give them uh, the implements and the, the instruments to engage other publics. And there's certainly been no drive to inform adversarial uh, publics. Uh, and, and, and I think much of the, the ideological uh, divide between uh, the left and right in uh, US jury, certainly, and probably a jury, a jury across the world, could be mitigated by having much more information available. At what level, you say you're uh, making the inter information available, uh, do you feel that um, uh, hawkish or um, revisionist, Zionist uh, teachings are excluded from academic curricula by the chair people, administration? Well, to a certain extent, definitely. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, just today I read a, uh, an article in which uh, a teacher who was dismissed during the, the Rabin area for refusing to teach Rabin's political doctrine. He was, he was dismissed by the, the Minister of, of Education, Yuli Tamil, who is now, of course, at, at Tel Aviv University. And he, he sued the Ministry of Education and, and the individuals who fired him. And he's just won a suit of 400,000 shekels. So, uh, you, you know, if you, if you, if you look at the, the, the curricula that have been documented by the, the, organi the student organization in Imtil Tzu, you'll find a massive bias, a massive bias in favor of left-wing post-Zionist uh, uh, works relative to even moderately uh, centrist uh, Zionist treaties. Uh, so, as, as a whole, uh, there, is a, there is a huge left-wing bias in the Israeli establishment. By the way, you know, you don't have to believe me, you can, you can, you can sort of do the intellectual experiment yourself. Now, I would challenge anyone to identify a senior or prominent uh, academic in, the, in the, the disciplines which were relevant to the Oslo Agreements, whether it's political science, international relations, strategic studies, etc. Any senior tenured academic and certainly any candidate for tenure who opposed the, the peace process and warned that it would take the course that it did. You know, you had, you had when the Oslo agreements began, the so-called peace process, the Israeli public was roughly divided 50-50 for and against. The academia and the elites and the intellectuals were 99.99999% in favor and 0 0.00001 against. Now, two decades down the line, 
virtually all the dangers that the opponents warned of materialized and none of the benefits that the proponents promised came about. So at what stage do you, do you say that these people were wrong? And, and there's only one explanation for it because either the people who, the, the so-called experts who supported the program, they were either incompetent because they, could, they couldn't analyze it correctly or they were dishonest because they could and refused to say so because of peer pressure. Uh, and, and so I think there's a very worrying situation in the, the Israeli academic establishment. Do you notice any bias from the media, news media in Israel itself? Well, the Israeli media is undeniably biased in favor of the left-wing uh, uh, approach to the, at least to the Middle East conflict. When I say left and right, again, I mean uh, the, the, the litmus test of left and right in Israel is basically your position on the Palestinian issue with the so-called left supporting territorial uh, concessions and the so-called right opposing them. Uh, there is a huge bias in favor of the left wing. Uh, it's been slightly mitigated in recent years because of the, the uh, appearance of uh, Israel Ayom, the paper uh, financed by Sheldon Edelson, but only slightly because that's not really a, 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 a distinctly right-wing paper. Uh, it's, it's done a lot to break the stranglehold of Yediot Ochronot, which was a, a, a very left-wing uh, publication. But, uh, you know, people like Yossi Balin have a column in it, so, you know, how, how right-wing can it be? Mm -hmm. uh, you have vehemently left-wing, uh, anti-Zionist, post-Zionist uh, opinions being expressed in, ha in Haaretz newspaper, mm -hmm. and even, and even uh, uh, self-professed Zionists uh, strongly support the Palestinian, uh, uh, the Palestinian narrative at the expense of the, the Zionist narrative. Uh, and uh, it's very easy for uh, left-wing proponents uh, to access it. Uh, just recently uh, we had an interview with uh, Eitan Habel, who was Rabin's closest aide, extolling the virtues of the Oslo Agreement. Now, basically everything that was said there, virtually everything there, was incorrect or distorted or, or, or uh, misleading. But every year He's given an interview like this over and over and over again. And uh, in, in my latest article, which I entitled uh, How um, Urban Legends Become, uh, Become Universal Truths, I, I focus on this, uh, this interview with him and show basically how everything he says is, is completely detached from reality. You know, this, the so-called uh, political bonanza. Uh, that uh, Israel was supposed to, or the diplomatic bonanza that Israel was supposed to have reaped from it, is all smoke and mirrors. Because people don't realize that about two years before the Oslo agreements, half of humanity uh, established uh, diplomatic relations with Israel. China, uh, India, the Soviet Union, they all, they, all established, they all established diplomatic relations with Israel before uh, the Oslo Agreements, well before the Oslo Agreements. After the Oslo Agreements, you had countries like Burkina uh, uh, Faso and Andorra and Botswana uh, and, and uh, other smaller countries uh, signing agreements with Israel and establishing relationships. But that was hardly a, a significant change in its international uh, stature. Um, the same thing with, uh, on, with, with the economics. On the economic front, people don't realize that in the, the three years preceding Oslo, economic growth was greater than the three years following Oslo. Uh, and in both cases, it was fueled by the Soviet, the, the Soviet immigration. It wasn't fueled by the, the peace process. In fact, after Oslo II, uh, economic growth fell off steeply because of the violence in the Palestinian in, in Intifada. But this is not the picture projected by, by the press. They are still perpetuating the myth that Israel reaped great be uh, diplomatic benefits and economic fruits from this, which is just not true. Why do you think the Israeli press is um, permitted 
this uh, subjectivity, this left of center subjectivity to skew and sway the, the population of the Jewish state? Well, I, th I think to understand Israeli politics, you have to think of a limousine. Why a limousine? Because in a limousine you have a, a um, driver in official uniform and a smart cap and he holds the wheel and sometimes he turns it right and sometimes he turns it left and sometimes he accelerates and sometimes he slows down. So the uninformed observer might actually get the impression that he is in control and determines the destination of the vehicle. But he doesn't. You can change the driver. Uh, but you won't change the destination. You may, might change the style of driving, you might change slightly the route, but the destination will not change because the destination is determined by the people in the, in the back seat, the occupants of the back seat behind the shaded panes. And those are the Israeli civil society elites who basically set the agenda for the elected politicians. And what's happened is that uh, by a, a historical process, is that the left wing has managed to intimidate the right wing. And any criticism of the left wing is, is uh, uh, labeled a danger to free speech. And any criticism of the right wing is labeled incitement. And this is the da dynamic that's been driving the, the, the Israeli press. And, uh, and unless you can uh, confront that and curtail it and counter it, uh, it's going to continue. Uh, what would you like to see as, uh, as an alternative to, uh, to, to this notion, this, this forced notion of, of ceding uh, territory for uh, a, a Palestinian state uh, with the expectation of Jewish safety? Well, I do have a proposal. It's quite a detailed and elaborate proposal, and I've written quite extensively about it. And I don't really want to do a disservice by sort of compressing it into sound bites. But very briefly, it uh, is a tripartite proposal, which begins, which begins with uh, uh, the awareness that you have to avoid tunnel vision. You can't just focus on the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza. You have to look at the entire Palestinian issue, including the Palestinian diaspora. So the first part is the, the dissolution of UNRWA, which is the, the organization that deals with Palestinian, uh, Palestinian refugees. Now, that is the most essential issue towards any solution, because even if you believe in a two-state solution and you don't deal with UNRWA, your two-state solution will collapse and you will, you will have a flow of five million Palestinians coming to settle in the, in, in, in the, the evacuated areas, which of course will make them completely untenable. So the first issue is dealing with UNRWA and the Palestinian refugees in the Palestinian diaspora. The second issue is once you deal with, the, with, with UNRWA and dissolve UNRWA, uh, the Palestinian diaspora in the Arab countries will no longer be receiving their anomalous pay, their payoffs, which UNRWA does pay. So the next part is, is, is um, assertive and robust diplomatic pressure on Arab countries to stop the ethnic discrimination against the Palestinians who've been resident in their countries for almost, uh, uh, for, for over a half a century. Uh, such, such as Lebanon and Syria? Sure, where, where, where Palestinians are, are severely discriminated uh, against whether it comes to freedom of movement, ownership of property, the kinds of employment they're allowed to have, and to acquire citizenship. Now there is persuasive uh, evidence that the Palestinians as a whole in these countries want the citizenship of those countries and do not want the right of return. So the first step is the dissolution of UNRWA. The second step is, is diplomatic pressure on the Arab countries to absorb the Palestinians in their, in their territories as citizens, even using the budgets that UNRWA want to use to help, to help their, their absorption for, a, for a, a, a transition period. Now, for the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria and, uh, and, and Gaza, my suggestion is offering them very generous relocation loans so that they can build their lives elsewhere on an individual basis. Now people sometimes raise an eyebrow uh, when I suggest this, but there is persuasive statistical and anecdotal evidence that indicate that many Palestinians, a large number of Palestinians, 
would avail themselves of this opportunity and emigrate permanently and build a better life elsewhere. There's simply no other non-coercive uh, proposal that can secure the survival of Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people in the, in the long run. Uh, that, of course, is a very condensed and not necessarily the most convincing portrayal of the idea because of the brevity. But in a, in, in a nutshell, that, that's, that's what I'm suggesting. Do you see Jordan as the primary uh, 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 refuge? No, I, 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 the, 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 the whole point is that I don't want to determine the destination for the Palestinians. I want them to decide themselves. I want them to have enough finance on departure so that they would qualify for immigrants in any countries across the world. There are half a million Palestinians living in South America. Um, and uh, you know, the, f if Palestinians went to Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, there could be a huge influx of Palestinians there without being a perceptible change in the population. On the other hand, the Indonesian economy would receive a, a massive influx of funds because the Palestinians would not be arriving there as impoverished refugees, but as relatively wealthy people by Indonesian standards, probably with seven decades worth of GDP uh, in Indonesian terms. But the, the point is that, that in, in order to fashion an alternative to the two-state solution, you must realize that Israel has to, if it wants to remain the nation state of the Jewish people, contend with two imperatives, the geographic imperative and the demographic imperative. The two-state solution does not address adequately the geographic imperative. And the one-state solution, which is now being bandied about even by some right-wing uh, uh, politicians doesn't address the demographic imperative. The only, the only non-coercive uh, solution is one which leaves the strategic, uh, the strategic areas, the strategic topography under Israeli control and begins to, to uh, uh, diminish the Arab presence west of the, the, the Jordan River, preferably by non-coercive means, and the only non-coercive means that I can think of are positive inducements, uh, like large uh, relocation loans. Um, I do not believe that there's any other non-coercive way of, of maintaining stability in the, in the, in the region. While you, you may move them physically, do you suppose that you could, or that this solution would remove their irredentist aims to somehow liberate the land of a Jew, Jewish or Zionist control? Well, I, I don't believe that that's a pervasive uh, a sentiment because as you, as you yourself have said, that, that uh, many of the Palestinians in, in, in uh, the Arab world want the citizenship there. Uh, the, uh, the general public uh, is interested in their own material well-being. Of course, you do have radicalized uh, and extremist le leadership that, that perpetuate that, uh, that, uh, that, that sentiment. But I feel that once, once you, you, you start these waves of, of, of dissipating the Arab presence in, in, uh, in these areas, that whole myth will collapse.